Hi, uh, I'm Julian Coman. I'm the Associate Editor of The Observer, and I'm here today with Faisal Islam, Channel 4's Economics Editor, and the author of a book which will come out at the end of August, which is called The Default Line, The Inside Story of People, Banks and Entire Nations. You make a reference to a journalistic default as part of, at the very beginning of The Default Line. So why did journalists get it rather wrong in relation to the boom of the mid-2000s? Why did no one see what was coming? If you take a step back, I mean, this is part of a broader picture of our relationship to finance and the housing market as well. You know, journalism was probably a force for, well, definitely was a force for what an economist would call pro-cyclicality, pro kind of mm -hmm. uh, helping build up the bubble at its uh, kind of most extreme ebb, and then probably uh, aiding the despondency on the way down too. And it, I think of myself, like if I had a time machine and we could go back and we could unpick what went wrong and when it went wrong, why weren't the hacks, the journalists doing, asking these sorts of questions at the time? Uh, there are many factors which nobody was writing about at the time. So there was a journalistic default. Uh, and part of this is trying to kind of, if you like, uh, make up for that. Um, a number of journalists and economists claim great prophecies for what was going on. I don't, you know, I'm not hugely convinced about that at the time. Actually, in 2003, for The Observer, when I was here, I did write a series of pieces about how it was impossible, right. impossible for house prices to go up from this stage. And lots of other economists were saying the same thing. And they did. They doubled again uh, uh, in the next five years. Apparently, which lost me a lot of friends. Apparently defying logic and actually defying logic, as it turned out. Yeah, in the end. but uh, the, uh, uh, the answers lay in the murky corners of the mm. shadow banking system. Uh, though nobody even called it the shadow banking system at the time. So one might argue there's a bit of 2020 hindsight, but that's really important. And in any event, I think going back over what went wrong is, is the surest uh, kind of, well, it's the most important factor in determining what to make mm -hmm. right. Uh, you know, I, th I think one of the, the key lessons I would say is it's very easy to bash bankers and there's much to bash bankers about, but actually, um, if you look at what's going on in the Eurozone and in Britain, we're living through the consequences of decisions made 10 years ago. And the decisions being made now will have consequences for people in 10 years. I mean, how do we hold that stuff to account? So I'd like to talk about those future decisions, uh, particularly with regard to the Eurozone. But um, just before doing that, you start the book with Greece. Um, and Greece was, uh, <laughs> if you like, the victim par excellence of a structure that had been set up, namely the euro currency, um, without fiscal union, without a system for transfer between countries. Uh, the result was close to a complete catastrophe in Greece, wasn't it? And you have some incredibly detailed information about just how, how close Greece got to simply running out of money. Yeah, so uh, the phrase running out of money is often used uh, metaphorically by journalists and by economists. I think what's quite intriguing in Greece, they literally did nearly run out of banknotes. There's one intriguing anecdote here, but it tells you a lot about how the Eurozone is run. Um, they have a printing press in Greece, and uh, but they only got given the plates, or they only had the plates at the time of uh, fairly extensive, but kind of controlled bank runs in 2011 and 2012. They only had the plates for the 10 euro note. So they could only right. print 10 euros. Only German speaking countries have ever had the plates for the 500 euro note, which is the highest value bank note in the world. Uh, that might be coincidence. It's, Who it knows? Sound like <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But uh, at the time, in 2011 and in 2012, such was the demand for banknotes. And in Greece, you would go to a bank and you'd get, uh, you'd say, I want 100,000 euros. And then they would phone up the central bank and you'd order the notes and you'd get it the next day. So, you know, the, it, it, there was some control over this. But the central bank of Greece quite quickly uh, had to amass a huge stock of notes just to fulfill demand for banknotes in that country. I'll give you a statistic. Mm. Typically, developed countries have, as a percentage of their national economy, about three, four, five percent of GDP in the actual value of banknotes. You might think that that's quite low. Um, Greece had about seven or eight percent um, in 09, I think it was. Uh -huh. By 2012, it was 25 percent. 
that's, I think, more than most developing countries. So it was, a, it was full of cash because people only believed in cash and they were hiding it under their mattresses. They were using up all the safe, depo uh, 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 safe deposit boxes. Mm. They were taking it abroad and buying property uh, in, in Britain, for example. Um, but they physically needed that cash. Uh, and there was an ex astonishing logistical operation to get the euro notes uh, use, uh, air freighted over secretly without telling anyone to stop any panic. Uh, and uh, uh, two very well-placed informants uh, have told me that included at some stages military planes from, right. from, from Rome. And so I liken this to a kind of uh, the Athens airlift. And if you want to know what would have happened in the absence of this, mm. Uh, you only have to go to Cyprus uh, four or five months ago. You say there's been a generational shafting of the young of epic proportions uh, during these five, six years of crisis. It would seem that we have a generation of young people who are growing up unable to get a full-time job, many of them certainly unable to buy a home or even think about it in the near future. Um, how do you think this generation in power of politicians, but not only politicians, also businessmen and so on. How can the generation that holds the levers of power make sure that there is something other than an utterly grim future for people under 25 at the moment? Well, I think they're going to have to think of a way to deal with this. The first thing is, is what I would say, because otherwise they're going to leave. This is a generation who are now conditioned to expect basically lower living standards than their parents. I think that there's a growing anger about housing and a lot of the book is taken up with describing the very dysfunctional relationship that Britain has with property. You see it around the world too, but it's particularly acute uh, in Britain. And it's not like people weren't warned about this. You know, I know that the Bank of England, for example, would say in private, you know, why aren't young people rebelling more about the fact that a trebling of house prices. No one's really getting it. Society has not yeah. gained net net from that. And you sort of think every, every bit, every bit of work that's been done to try and create a kind of more meritocratic society is being undone by the housing market. And the inequalities are returning partly through that. And partly well, it's kind of rentier capitalism. It's kind of partly, uh, it's kind of quasi feudal, really. Um, I, I wouldn't want to overstate that, but, I, uh, but uh, uh, no one's going to be sent back with their hose to the, to the fields just yet. But I think when you think about how much political capital is invested in the idea of, you know, uh, the generational fairness of keeping the environment um, uh, clean uh, or uh, the national debt, this is a great generational uh, inequity that, you know, you bequeath future debts. But then we don't actually begin to make kind of very basic planning, bearing in mind that every other country in the world uh, is, is making serious plans for the economy. I kind of think, yeah, people are being failed and I worry. I speak as a prospective near parent, so... Uh, <laughs> right, so it's a growing <laughs> so it sense of urgency. Well, yeah, yeah. No, it does, it, 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 yeah, it matters hugely, I think. Okay, well, I think we'll have to wrap it up there, but it's been great to talk. Um, good luck with the book, which is, as I say, is out on, at the end of August, and there'll be an extract in this weekend's Observer. So make sure you have a look at that.